Welcome back to the Skin Physiology and Biochemistry playlist. Uh, in this video, we're going to go over the physiology of the melanocyte. Okay, and, and we'll look at how the melanosome works in later videos. Okay, and if you're in my anatomy and physiology class, this is a required video for you to watch. This is part of your pre-lab exercise to watch this video and learn from it so it's a required video and pretty much everything in this video is required if there's anything that's not required I will let you know as we go throughout the video okay but in this video what we're essentially going to do is we're going to go over the function of a cell called the melanocyte okay and the melanocyte is a cell that is going to biosynthesize melanin. And we've gone over kind of extensively what the function of melanin is. And suffice it to say, in, from a simplistic point of view, it's a molecule, a polymer of different types of molecules that protects the underlying DNA and underlying tissues from UV light from the sun. We talked about how UV light is an extremely energetic form of light, and so it can cause formation of free radicals in DNA, and that's something you don't want. So the melanin acts sort of like the border patrol, where it's protecting the underlying tissues from ultraviolet light from the sun. Okay, and in the very previous video, the one we just watched, uh, we went over the synthesis of a hormone called alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone. Now, that video is not required of you um, for uh, the ANP class that I teach, but I do want you to understand that the cell or the tissues that make alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone are the anterior pituitary gland, or we typically call that the adenohypophysis. So this is the adenohypophysis. That's the tissue that makes alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone. Okay, And then alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone kind of circulates in the blood, just like all of those tropic hormones that come from the anterior pituitary gland. And it's ultimately going to end up binding to the alpha MSH receptor on a melanocyte. So that's what this guy is right here. This whole cell right here which kind of has these little arms sticking out, which are called dendrites. This is called the melanocyte, and they're located in your skin, and they're responsible for making melanin. So there's a melanocyte-stimulating hormone receptor right here. Let me circle it. So this is the receptor right there, and alpha-melanocyte-stimulating hormone binds there. Okay. Now, I will say this, that uh, there is sort of a, a mistake in this picture. Uh, they have this enzyme shown right here, which I'll circle in black. This enzyme, which is abbreviated AC, this is the enzyme that's shown right here. If you wanted to write the full name of this, not just the um, abbreviation, this is called adenylate, adenylate cyclase, an extremely important enzyme in biosignaling, and certainly that's the case here. Now, the mistake is that actually adenylate cyclase is actually a membranous enzyme. Okay, so it's actually located here in the membrane, but that's not too terribly important for you to understand. Um, I do want you to know that um, whenever the alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone binds to the receptor, it ultimately activates adenylate cyclase. Now, if you're looking at this from the context of biochemistry, not my class, I would have, I, I would hope that you would realize that alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone receptor is a is it basically a G protein coupled receptor. So there's going to be a G protein um, that is attached to the receptor, and when alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone hormone binds, the G protein alpha subunit dissociates and it activates adenylate cyclase. Okay, so you don't have to know that for my A&P class, but certainly if you're looking at it from a biochemical perspective or a biosignaling perspective, alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone binds to the receptor, it activates the G protein and the alpha subunit of the G protein dissociates and then it activates adenylate cyclase. Now, what I want to show you, and this is again not required for um, my class, this is the net reaction of adenylate cyclase. So this, this substrate over here on the left, this is called adenosine triphosphate. Now when I say it's not required, I don't require you to know any structures, but I do want you to know the net reaction. Okay, So we have ATP that's going to effectively get converted into this molecule, which is called cyclic adenosine monophosphate. If you wanted to be really specific, you would say 3 prime. 5 prime cyclic AMP. That's the full name, but I'll simply accept cyclic AMP. Okay, so whenever adenylate cyclase becomes activated, 
you get an increase in the concentration of cyclic AMP, which is shown right here. So there's an increase in intracellular cyclic AMP. Now there's another protein that we also have a video on in, in, the, biochemistry, in the biochemistry video network. It's called protein kinase A. Okay? And what cyclic AMP is able to do is it's able to activate protein kinase A. So that's what this PKA is. This is protein protein kinase A, or we abbreviate it as PKA. So when cyclic AMP starts to rise in the cytosol of the melanocyte, or any cell for that matter, it tends to activate protein kinase A. Okay. Now, protein kinase A is a kinase, so what it essentially does is it transfers phosphates onto different proteins. And it turns out that one of the proteins that it transfers a phosphate onto is this transcription factor known as CREB, which CREB, you don't have to know this. You have to know what CREB is. It's a transcription factor. But if you want to know what CREB stands for, it's called cyclic AMP response element binding protein. Okay. Now, what a transcription factor essentially does in humans is it activates the gene for transcription. So, you know, we had this whole lecture on transcription going from DNA to mRNA, but in humans and other uh, like species like mammals, uh, you have to activate the gene in order for RNA polymerase to bind. And so most genes are kept transcriptionally inactive. And so you have to have these transcription factors to activate the gene. And I hope that makes sense. Okay. Now there's two other proteins mainly that are two other transcription factors that have to bind along with CREB, and those are called PAX3. PAX3 is another protein that has to bind, and then SOX10. So it turns out that when these three transcription factors accumulate on a certain region of the DNA, you get transcription of another protein. I'll do this in a bold color like yellow. This protein is called, let me do it in orange instead. This protein that gets transcribed and eventually translated is called MITF. So P300 dimerizes with phosphorylated MITF. And these two components, let me scroll down a little bit. These two components right here, MITF in the phosphorylated state and P300, whenever they dimerize, what they do is they act as a transcription factor complex for other genes. One of the genes that they activate is called BCL2. So a protein that gets translated is called BCL2. Okay, and BCL2, what it promotes is cell survival. And the way it does that is it prevents apoptosis or programmed cell death. It prevents apoptosis of the melanocyte. So the melanocyte ends up living longer, and so it's able to carry out its action for a longer period of time. Okay. Therefore, it's able to make more melanin for a longer period of time because apoptosis is essentially inhibited by BCL2. So we call this process, we call it cell, we call it cell survival. Cell survival, meaning we inhibit apoptosis. Okay? Now, there's some other stuff that this complex of MITF and P300 do, and it's called upregulating or causing the protein synthesis of melanogenic enzymes. So when we say melanogenic, what we really mean are enzymes that synthesize melanin. So these right here, these are enzymes that synthesize melanin. Okay, They lead to the synthesis of melanin, so that's really important to understand. Now, there are two main proteins that are going to be involved in the synthesis of melanin. We'll go into those in later videos. Those enzymes are called tyrosinase, which arguably is the most important. Tyrosinase is the enzyme that does the committed step in melanin synthesis. And the other one, which we also will have a video on, is called dopachrome tautomerase. So these are the main two enzymes that get upregulated. Um, by this complex of MITF and P300, meaning that when MITF and P300 dimerize into a transcription factor complex, they lead to the synthesis of tyrosinase and dopachrome tautomerase, and both of these guys cause an increase in the synthesis of melanin. And then on top of that, we could also include that you get increased synthesis of this B. BCL2, which is shown right here. This is BCL2, and that ultimately leads to cell survival. 
Okay, so the question is, you know, we have these, you know, we have these tyrosine aces and we have these dopachrome tautomerases, and the question is, does this happen in the nucleus? Does the synthesis of melanin happen in the cytosol? Where is it occurring? Well, it turns out that these proteins, tyrosinase and dopachrome tautomerase, they're essentially packaged into these organelles that are inside the dendrites of the melanocyte. And these organelles, which I'm highlighting in black, these are called melanosomes. Okay, so there's some over there, there's some over here. Melanosomes are the organelles that synthesize melanin. So these are melanosomes. This is where melanin synthesis occurs. So this is where the monomers of melanin synthesis occurs. And this is where they're polymerized into the melanin polymer. It occurs in the melanosomes. Okay, now there's two types of melanosomes. Number one, there's a eumelanosome, which synthesizes eumelanin. And there's also a pheomelanosome that synthesizes pheomelanin. So there are two main types of melanin. There's eumelanin and pheomelanin. Eumelanin is responsible for the blackish-brown tint of skin and pheomelanin is responsible for reddish and blonde so the more red it is the, um, the more pheomelanin there is and you'll find that in places like uh, the areola of the nipple uh, you'll find it a lot of times in the genital region and also people with red hair they have lots of pheomelanin and it turns out that these two syntheses are biochemically and structurally compartmentalized so pheomelanin synthesis mostly occurs in the pheomelanosome and eumelanin synthesis mostly occurs in the eumelanosome so what literally happens are these enzymes uh, tyrosinase and dopachrome tautomerase, they're packaged into these melanosomes, and in here, in these guys, this is where the melanin synthesis occurs. So the monomers are synthesized there, and then the polymerization also occurs there. And these structures where it occurs in, these little arms that kind of come off of the melanocyte, these are called melanocyte, these are called melanocyte dendrites. These are the dendrites of the melanocyte. Okay, and it turns out the dendrites are also responsible for transferring the melanin polymers into other cells like your skin cells. And so we'll talk about how that occurs in another video. You are not responsible for that um, in my anatomy and physiology class, but I do want you to kind of understand how the, the enzymes get upregulated in melanin synthesis. So in order to illustrate that, let's do a quick recap of this video. So alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone is synthesized by the anterior pituitary gland or the adenohypophysis and it's sent through the blood ultimately to reach the melanocyte. And alpha MSH is going to bind to an alpha MSH receptor called MC1R and when it binds this seven transmembrane receptor or this G protein coupled receptor, a G protein activates and that protein activates adenylate cyclase. That's what this enzyme is right here. That is adenylate cyclase, AC, adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase catalyzes this reaction right here, the conversion of ATP to 3 prime, 5 prime cyclic AMP. And so you get an increase in cyclic AMP. And the cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A. Protein kinase A is able to phosphorylate cellular targets like transcription factors. One of the transcription factors it phosphorylates is CREB, cyclic AMP response element binding protein, but you can just call it CREB. CREB along with PAX3 and SOX10 act as a transcription factor complex and they lead to the synthesis of this guy, which is the MITF gene. And that leads to synthesis of mRNA, of course, and then protein synthesis. And then you get MITF in the phosphorylated state and that's phosphorylated by another enzyme. You don't need to worry about that. MITF then dimerizes with P300, and you get this transcription factor complex of P300 and MITF, and they act as a transcription factor for three main proteins, tyrosinase and dopachrome tautomerase, which are enzymes needed to synthesize the monomers of melanin, Okay, and then you also get BCL2, which causes cell survival and the prevention of apoptosis. And if you prevent apoptosis, that just means the melanocyte is able to live longer and biosynthesize more melanin. And then these enzymes, tyrosinase and dopachrome tautomerase, are transported into these melanosomes right here. And in there, that's where the monomers of melanin are synthesized and also where the polymerization occurs. And just remember, if you're synthesizing eumelanin, the dark 
darker blackish brownish one that occurs in the u melanosome if you're synthesizing pheomelanin, which would be something where you see in like the areola of the nipple, um, genital region, and uh, people with red and, and blonde hair, that occurs in the pheomelanosome. And the more pheomelanin that's in those tissues, the redder it is. The lesser uh, pheomelanin there is, the lighter it is. So that would be something like blonde hair. So hopefully this process makes a little bit of sense. And this is something that you are required to know for the exam. So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on melanocyte function. In the next video, we'll go over the transfer of the melanin polymer to the cells in your skin, which occurs through these structures called dendrites. So I hope this video helps. See you in the next video.